start with questions from homework. Does anybody have anything you want to ask about? Uh, would it been like extrema and number of zeros and end behavior and polynomial division and that jazz? Last time you worked on the delta math when I was gone, but the time before, I wasn't. Yeah, Joey. Sure. <laughs> All right. So when I look at number 19, this is something that definitely has to be done using long division because the denominator is not degree one. <clears throat> so to use the synthetic division has to be degree one with leading coefficient of one. This one is clearly not. So I'm gonna set this up as a long division problem. But before I do that, I wanna notice in my denominator, I go x cubed, then x's and then constants. I skipped my x squareds. So I'm gonna use, I'm gonna put a zero x squared there. That'll help keep things lined up. And if I look at the numerator, I have x to the fifth, x to the fourth, x to the thirds. Again, I skip my x squareds, and then I have my x's and then constants. So again, I am going to put a zero x squared there. And again, like it's okay to not do that, but um, it certainly makes life way easier for everything to just line up where it's supposed to be. So that's my initial setup. And I'm gonna ask myself what times x cubed gives me four x to the fifth. Well, I need a four as a coefficient, right? And then I would need an x squared because we're adding exponents when you multiply. Yes, sir. So how do you know when, when, when to place the numbers above the uh, Well, whatever this is, whatever degree that is, it's going to be one less. Oh, one less? Yeah. Okay. So I just start the one before it or whatever. So I'm going to do 4x squared. And it doesn't really matter where you put it to me. I line them up so that everything looks nice, but like it doesn't really matter. And then that distributes through. And then we're gonna subtract down, right? Okay, now remember that Mr. Kulik likes to think about this as um, an addition problem, so he's going to distribute through that negative and then add down. Is that okay so far? 4x to the fifth plus negative 4x to the fifth is 0. 7x to the fourth minus or plus negative 0x to the fourth is still 7x to the fourth. Uh, 1x cubed plus negative 4x cubed is negative 3x cubed. 20x squared plus uh, 0x squared is 20x squared. And then I'm going to bring the rest of this down just so I don't forget about it at any point. Now I'm gonna repeat what times x cubed gives me seven x to the fourth. Seven x. And I distribute things through, so I have seven x to the fourth plus zero x to the third plus seven x squared minus 35 x. And then we're gonna subtract down 
So I'll distribute my negative through just like I did before. I'll kind of compact some of those steps there. Is that okay? So 7x to the fourth minus 7x to the fourth is 0. 3x cubed plus negative 0x cubed still is negative 3x cubed. Uh, 20x squared minus 7x squared is 13x squared. Uh, 35x plus 7x is 27x. And then I'll bring that 1 down. And then my last go around here, I'm going to ask myself what times x cubed gives me negative 3x cubed. That's negative 3. So I have negative 3x cubed uh, plus 0x squared minus 3x plus 15. And then we're going to subtract down. So I have 0, and then I have 13x uh, squared, 30x minus 14. So the final answer I'm going to write, my quotient 4x squared plus 7x minus 3, and then plus my remainder over my divisor. And that should do her. Is that the answer from the back? Yeah. Okay. It's always nice when you do one of these. There's a lot of opportunities to do something dumb and make a mistake here, right? But that's the idea. So again, um, if you haven't, aren't watching for those places where this term is skipped, like start doing that. It really makes life a lot easier to put those zeros in so everything lines up nice. Um, Again, it's okay if you don't. It's recoverable on a long division problem. But you got to notice that, like, oh, I'm adding an x squared to an x cubed. I can't do that. You know, so you have to, like, just makes it harder unnecessarily. Just put the zero in, you know. Uh, others, questions from homeworks? This is probably the hardest one in the set. Certainly the most time-consuming one. Great. Um, so today, we're going to kind of continue on. So again, we've been talking about polynomials. What we've been particularly interested in is finding the zeros for polynomials. And now we're going to say, okay, what if I have a polynomial where, like, I can't turn it into a quadratic factor problem, right? Like, what do I do with this? That's kind of where we're going to be working here for the rest of this chapter. Um, so we have a couple of tools that we're going to employ that we're going to kind of, yes. I have... Uh, 13, 4, is, there's four sections, so we're in three. We haven't had one yet, but what should you probably expect next class? Yeah. You guys groan and moan so much about these things, and they're like, the homework is worth more points than these things are. And you like moan and groan about them like it's the it's like the highest stakes thing ever. Oh well, just change your feelings. Well, you don't no like seriously, your brain dictates how you feel. Like you can change how you feel. Just just make a choice. I'd, I'd suggest rather just like making the choice that like this isn't that big of a deal and I can and I can do this, you know, like. All right. Um, so the first tool that we have is called this factor remainder theorem or the remainder theorem, excuse me. And it just says that if so we have some polynomial f of x and we divide it by some linear, I should say, monic factor. So we use the term monic 
when it's a the polynomial is degree one with leading coefficient one. So that's called a monic polynomial. Not important that you know that vocab, but I'll use it. Just means something like x minus k. Um, then it tells us the remainder for that function is going to be the same as f of k. So it changes this division problem into like a substitution problem, right? Where I'm just plugging k in for x and seeing what number I get. If we're going to turn this into a solving um, technique, what remainder am I looking for? Zero always, because we're going to be able to use that to build a factored form. And then we can uh, go on about our business here. So example, something you'll do in the homework. It says find f of 2 using the remainder theorem. So what that means is that we're going to take f of x and divide it by x minus 2, right? So the remainder theorem says that the remainder is going to be the same as f of k. Yes, Joy? Uh, I'm just following the theorem. Right, it says if you're doing f of k, then the polynomial you're dividing by was x minus k. So we're doing f of 2, so our polynomial would be x minus 2 that we're dividing by. Is that? Oh, okay. You see it? Yeah. Okay. And now it's just a polynomial division problem, so 2x... So we can say then f of 2 is equal to 2. Now this is not the order that we usually would use this, right? The order that we'd really want to use this is replacing substitution, or replacing division with substitution. In fact, that's what synthetic division is, is us replacing division with substitution. Um, because division is much more time consuming than like plugging two in for the x's, right? Giving me the choice to be like, well, I'd rather plug two in for the x's than do that polynomial division. Gag me. Ugh. Yeah, exactly. Um, but the fact that we can use those two interchangeably is lovely. That gives us what we'll call the factor theorem. It says we, uh, we can, uh, this, the factor theorem tells us that a polynomial function f of x has the factor x minus k if and only if f of k is equal to 0. So again, just what we predicted, if you have a remainder 0, that means that the polynomial you divided by was a factor. And since division and substitution, or the remainder of division and the value of substitution are the same for polynomials. Instead of checking to see if I get a zero remainder, I can just see if I plug in and get a zero, when, or if it evaluates the zero and I plug the number in, which is much easier to do than polynomial division, or at least less time consuming, right? Um, so, Example, whoa, that was got too big. Says, use the factor theorem to show that x plus 3 is a factor of 6x cubed plus 25x squared plus 16x minus 15. So this is like my x minus k, right? Everybody's okay there? 
So to figure out what k is, I'm going to take the x plus 3, set it equal to 0, and solve. That's my k. So I just need to do this. And that gives me zero when I plug that into my calculator. Um, or more commonly, the way we typically do that is as a synthetic substitution. Oh. Come on, Mr. Kulik. Where's my mistake? It's the very first thing. There's six there, you dummy. Well, you know what, guys? We all have our days, right? There we go. That's what we're looking for, right? Remainder zero. This is substitution also, right? You can do substitution this way also. Um... Blah, 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 blah. And what does this mean equivalently? So let's think about what this is saying. So it says that if I have x cubed plus 25x squared plus 16x minus 15, and I divide it by x plus 5, I'm going to get 6x squared plus 7x minus 5. Again, those are coming right from those. And if I just multiplied both sides then by x plus 3, what am I going to have? Well, I'm going to have at least a partial factoring of that original polynomial, right? That that's at least a partial factoring. I don't know if I can factor 6x squared plus 7x minus 5 anymore. Maybe I can, maybe I can't. But at least it's a partial factoring, if not a complete. Everybody's okay? Well, I, I, I mean that I don't know if I can do more to the 6x squared plus 7x minus 5. Like, I still might have some more factoring I can do. This might be all I can do, or there might be more. I don't know that right now, but it's at least a partial, right? I don't know if it's complete or not. There might be still more to do. I, from what I've done, I can't tell that. I'd have to check that quadratic to see if I could factor it. And if it wasn't quadratic... What would I do then? I don't even, we don't have an answer for that yet. Yet. Um, so, again, this process here, this synthetic substitution process, we can use also as a synthetic division process. They can be used interchangeably. So, Again, in the homework, you might be asked to do things like this, to say use a synthetic division and the remainder theorem to evaluate f of negative 5. So we'll just set that up as a synthetic division problem. Why did I put that 0 there? Yeah, I skipped the x cubes, right? When you're doing synthetic division, you have to put in the zeros. There's no getting around it. You cannot recover from it. You can't fix it. It'll just be wrong and always be wrong. You won't be able to get away with it.
So that's my f of negative 5, then, that 2332. Right? We remember doing synthetic division last time. You had to do it on your delta math, too. I'm hoping that since nobody asked anything about it, we all felt okay remembering how to do that. What is the rule for when you're able to do it? The divisor, degree one, leading coefficient one. Now you can make it work if the leading coefficient isn't one. You can do like some clever factoring thing and still make that work. I think they ask, I ask you to do that once or twice in the homework. Um, and if you couldn't figure out how to make it work, we can talk about it when we get to it or whatever, but that's basically what we're looking for. So if it's degree, if it's not degree one, there's no workarounds. All right. Um, so what we need to, what we see here, what our what our takeaway should be, is that if we can identify at least one factor, like we did in this problem, we can use that factor through synthetic division to create a partial factoring. And if we can keep doing that, keep finding factors and doing the division, we can eventually find a complete factoring for our polynomial. Everybody's okay with that? That's eventually going to turn into our process for solving these polynomials. The trick here, or the catch, the thing that's left unstated is how do we find these potential factors? And that's what we're going to spend some time now talking about, is how to find these potential factors. So there's going to be a couple of different ways to do this. The first one is called the rational zeros theorem. Oops. I actually want to take that also. All right, so the rational zeros theorem says that any possible rational zero, when I say rational, what do we mean in mathematics? It's a number that can be written as a fraction. So seven, rational. Two-thirds, rational. Square root of two, irrational. Pi, irrational. Square root of 4? It's rational because the square root of 4 is just 2. But basically that's what we're saying here. So the things that aren't square roots or like some other weird constant like pi or e or something like that. All right. Uh, it tells us that any possible rational zero of the polynomial can be written as p over q, where p is every possible factor of the constant term. That's the last number. And q is every possible factor of the leading coefficient, the first number. Uh, and this will give us our starting point. Again, can I point out to us what hopefully is obvious? Factors and zeros are intimately related, right? If I know the zeros of a polynomial, I can reconstruct the factors of a polynomial. Right? For example, if I know that like let's say that I have a polynomial that has the zeros 1, negative 1, and 2. I can take those, um, oops, I can take those zeros and turn them into factors. So I can like subtract the one from both sides, add the one to both sides, and subtract the two from both sides. And now they look like factors, right? And if I take those three equations and I multiply them together,
I have now a factored polynomial that has the same zeros, right? So like observe that the zero of x equals one is equivalent to the polynomial having a factor of x minus one, right? And then I could FOIL this thing out if I wanted to. And there's a polynomial that has those three zeros, right? Is this the only one? Could I do something like that? Does that polynomial still have the same three zeros? Yeah, the only zeros it has is negative one, or positive one, negative one, and positive two, right? Now, those zeros are going to occur, occur more than once. They're going to have multiplicities greater than one, but that's still a valid polynomial. How do I know which one I'd want? Typically, we ask for the minimum degree. So you wouldn't want to, even though you could include some silly exponent on there, like, like why? Why would you want to do that? You wouldn't, right? All right, um, back to the rational zeros theorem. Now that we've kind of tried to connect the idea of a zero with a factor, Okay, it says make a list of every possible rational zero for the polynomial. Notice that this is possible. We don't know that these are actually zeros, but they are. If there's a rational zero, it has to be something from this list. So remember, we have p over q, where p is the constant term and q is the leading coefficient. So my possible factors for p are going to be the factors of 4. What are all the factors of 4? 2 is a factor of 4. Great. What else? 4 is a factor of 4. What else? 8 is not a factor of 4 because 8 doesn't divide 4 and give you a whole number. 1. Okay. You're still missing 3. Good. Yeah, and negative 4. So it should all be plus or minuses. And then my Q, which is this one, what are my factors of 3? Good. So my possible rational zeros should be plus or minus 1 over 1, and then 1 over 3. And then plus or minus 2 over 1, and then 2 over 3. and then plus or minus 4 over 1, and then 4 over 3. Is everybody okay with how I wrote that? Um, in practice, we'd probably just write those as plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, and plus or minus 4. So far, so good. You guys remember doing that last year? Good. Some people shook their head. I'll take that for enough that everybody remembered. Uh, another theorem. This one is much less relevant for you than it was for me as a student. Uh, this says if f of x is a polynomial with a positive leading coefficient, 
and we divide by k using synthetic division, if k is greater than or equal to zero for every number in the bottom line, oh, I'm sorry, and every number in the bottom line is non-negative, that means positive or zero, then k is an upper bound for all of the real zeros of f. If k is less than or equal to zero, then and every number in the bottom line is alternately non-negative and non-positive, then k is a lower bound for all of the real zeros of f. So what this is doing is it's creating a search, a clever choice of k can create a search space where it's like, okay, I know all of my zeros are in between this value and this value. So you can, might be able to overlay that with what we had before and like eliminate some of these possibilities, right? If I know everything is between negative one and two, well, that chops out some possibilities for me. It makes my life a little bit easier because I've eliminated some things from my list. Now, for you guys, that's much less helpful because what tool do you have access to that I did not? Graph and calculate. Because what can we do with the graphing calculator to check this? Just graph the polynomial and look at where the zeros are at, right? Because you'll be able to see all the real zeros as x-intercepts. So you can just use your graphing calculator to do this. Um, although this is still in the homework, so let's do an example. And maybe Mr. Kulik would even ask you to be able to do this on the test. <gasps> oh no. All right, so our example says show that every real zero of the polynomial 6x cubed blah, 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 lies within the interval of negative 5 to 4. So to do this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a synthetic division with my lower bound. Oops. And then with my upper bound, everybody's okay there. So notice that this number is less than zero. So what I'm looking for is alternatively non-negative and non-positive. So I know that negative five is a lower bound. Everybody feel okay there? I'm looking at the numbers, right? Six is positive, negative five is negative. So I'm just checking those numbers to make sure they're alternating between non-positive and non-negative. They just have to alternate. What? If K is negative and the numbers underneath alternate, then K was a lower bound, okay? I want to point out that it says non-negative and non-positive. So what is also okay? Zero, right? If this was six, zero, zero, negative 20, or negative 220, that would be okay. Because zero is non-positive, and then zero again would be non-negative. Everybody's okay there? That typically trips students up when they see that. All right, let's do the other one. Oops, that's not right. So, if your K is positive and all those numbers at the bottom are non-negative, 
that's what we're looking for. So we know that four is a upper bound. Everybody okay there? So when I was a student, this is how I started after I made my list, is I'm just trying to like cut this down to as narrow of a bound as I can, and then I'd start checking the rational zeros in between the bounds, and it was a pure guess and check. But this could be a big time saver, especially if you had like, you know, like 32x cubed, blah, 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 and then like, 18 x or 18 at the end where it's just like there's so many factors of 32 and 18 like there's just like ugh, there's like a million things to check can i make this a little bit better you know so i'd start from like negative one to one and then negative two to two and like negative three to three and just keep stepping out until i found like aha i got one here then I just step out ah i get one here and now i know the only stuff i need to check is stuff in between Usually that makes life like a lot simpler. But if you have a graphing calculator, it's kind of uh, irrelevant. So let's do like, let's put these ideas together here. With an example. So it wants us to find all the real zeros for this polynomial. So So I know that we should have how many zeros at most? Okay, and then I'm going to do my possible rational zeros. So those are going to be factors of 30 divided by factors of 6. Yuckaruskis. So um, let's write it this way. My factors of 30... It's always the constant term divided by the leading coefficient. Is it okay that I write my fraction this way instead of like writing this as like uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, set of four or 36 separate fractions. I should say 72 separate fractions. It's okay. Feel like that's just easier on all of us, right? Okay. Now I'm gonna go to my calculator. And I'm gonna write down what I see when I graph my polynomial. If you have your calculator with you and you'd like to follow along, I invite you to do so. So I'm just typing in the polynomial that I'm trying to find the zeros for. Shh. Please listen. And now I'm going to reset my window. What is the biggest possible rational zero I have on my list? And the smallest? Nope. Negative 30, right? So I'm going to set my x min at negative 30 and my x max at positive 30. And all I care is about this thing crossing the x or the x-axis, right? So I'm going to set my y min to be a negative number and my y max to be a positive number, but I don't really care. Um, I'm going to just do like negative 2 and positive 2. 
And then I'm going to hit graph and take a look at what I see. So it looks like I see three zeros happening, um, but it looks like they're all much closer in here and I can't really tell what's going on very well because of my window. So I'm going to chop my window down and maybe go from negative seven to positive three. Okay. 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 So this one looks like x equals negative six to me, right? It's going straight through the tick mark. You guys buy that. When I say straight, do you remember what I mean? Remember we had that bend bounce straight theorem from before where the how the graph is crossing the x-axis tells me the multiplicities. This one is going, all these are going straight through, right? This one looks like maybe x equals negative a half. But I'm going to put a question mark by that because I can't really tell for sure. I'm just kind of guessing. And this one is maybe two and a half. Again, I'm going to put a question mark by that because I'm just kind of guessing. The next thing I'm going to do now that I've looked at my calculator is I'm going to check to see if any of these that I saw on my list appear on my, or saw on my calculator appear on my list. And I see all three of them do. Does everybody agree? Now, so each of these three would be a plausible choice as a starting point for my synthetic division. But here, there's one here that I would certainly pick if I had my choice. Which one should I pick? Negative six, why? It's not a fraction, that's a good reason. The second good reason is, how confident am I that that x-intercept is actually at negative one-half and not, say, negative one-third? And how do I know it's five over two instead of four over three? Or, what you know, like six over, or, uh, you know, whatever, right? Like, ugh, that's kind of confusing, right? Um, or 15 over six or something, you know, like, could be something kooky. The negative six I feel the best about, that that's actually where the zero is. You guys agree with that? And it's more that second reason that I'm concerned with than the first. Although if I can avoid having to deal with a fraction, I'll happily take that. Agreed? So I'm going to start my synthetic division. Oops. So that did work, right? So what does this tell me then? It tells me that my, oops, my starting polynomial is equal to x plus six times six x squared minus 13 x minus five. I'm able to say the x plus 6 because negative 6 gives me a 0 remainder. And I'm able to say the 6x squared minus 13x minus 5 because that was the quotient of my division. Does everybody feel okay there? So now if I'd like to solve this the rest of the way, I can do one of two things. I could continue doing synthetic division on 
what I have left, I could do another synthetic division there with the negative one half or the positive five over two. I don't love that option though for the reasons we stated before. Number one, those are fractions. Number two, I'm less confident. I had to like estimate where those were. I'm not super duper confident that that's actually those zeros. Um, the other option is because this piece right here is quadratic, I could just apply the zero product property here and forego doing a complete factoring because if I have a quadratic factor that's equal to zero, what other tool can I use? I wouldn't do that. You have a quadratic that's equal to zero and you want to solve for x. Well, what factoring works sometimes. What if it's not factorable, though? What can we still use? The quadratic formula. So as soon as I have a quadratic factor, I'm going to stop, and I'll just use the quadratic formula there. Unless it's like leading coefficient of 1 and it's simple for me to factor this. If I look at this, this is not, I can't factor that in my head. So I would just use the quadratic formula here. So remember what the quadratic formula says is for a quadratic ax squared plus bx plus c equal to 0, x is equal to negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. Just as a reminder. Okay, uh, so negative of negative 13 is 13. Uh, 13 squared is 169 plus uh, 120. So 120 plus 169 is 289, and I think that's a perfect square. The square root of 289 is 17, I thought so. So if I add those, 13 plus 17 over 2 is, uh, oops, sorry, 12 is 30 over 12, which is um, 5 over 2. That matched what we saw. And then 13 minus 17 over 12 is negative 4 over 12. Ooh, that was negative 1 third not negative a half. I guess we misestimated that one, but that's okay. I noticed that those are both still things that were on my list to start with, so I feel pretty good about my answers. What do you think about that? Mary said I didn't like it. You remember doing it? Yes, that was the instructions was to find the zeros. Um, you feel like there's easier ways to do that. Okay. Well, the next step is um, what happens if instead of asking for all the real zeros, we ask for the complex ones as well? Can the calculator find those for you? No. So if we want all of the zeros in totality, we're going to have to use this process, and that's where we're going next. Okay, so that's let's start in on that because it's just a natural extension of this process we've just outlined. Um, the other thing I would say also, um, Luca, is that if I ask for exact values and my zero is like 1 plus the square root of 2 over 5, your calculator's not going to be able to give you that either, right? It'll only give you the decimal approximation of it. 
So you have that issue. Not a huge issue as much as the imaginary piece is, right? Like it just flat out won't be able to find those. Okay. All right, so you remember that uh, zeros and extrema theorem. Here is our final version of that. This version is called the Fundamental Theorem of Algebra. This is actually not the statement for the Fundamental Theorem of Algebra. Um, the Fundamental Theorem of Algebra just says that all polynomials are solvable. And then the corollary to that is a polynomial of degree n will have exactly n complex solutions provided that we're counting our multiplicities. Those repeated zeros get counted separately. But if you do that, you get exactly n solutions. Get exactly the degree. Remember, we teased that there was an update for that coming. Well, here it is. Um, Now, in addition to that, we're going to drop two other theorems real quick. That, oh, do we have not a statement for the other one? All right, whatever. We'll just say it in words with it. Um, the next theorem is called the complex conjugates theorem. So it says that if you have a polynomial that has real coefficients and it has the complex factor a plus b i then the conjugate of that factor a minus b i also must be a factor for the polynomial um, so and the same thing happens for irrational conjugates as well. Ah, darn it. So let's say we want asked to write the polynomial of least degree that has the zeros 1, negative 3, and 1 plus i square root 2. The complex conjugates theorem tells us if I have 1 plus i square root 2, I also have to have 1 minus i square root 2. So doing what we did before, we can take each of these and turn them into factors. And I like to think of the complex number all as one big thing, so I'm going to subtract it with the parenthesis around it over. I'm doing that for a reason, it just is going to make the next process is I think a little easier um, so then I multiply all the pieces together everybody's okay so far I'm going to multiply these out now. So I'm always going to FOIL when I choose to FOIL. I'm always going to put the conjugate pairs together in the same FOIL. Nice things happen when you do that. You don't want to FOIL a non-conjugate pair with another non-conjugate pair. Like, it just gets gross looking. So I FOILed that first one. Now to FOIL this, the way I'm going to think about this is I'm going to do x times x. I'm going to do x times that, so I have negative, and then 1 minus i square root 2, x. I'm going to do that, so I'm going to have minus 
1 plus i square root 2x. And then I'm going to have these two together. Is everybody okay with how I foiled that? And you see why treating like that complex number is just like one big chunk made this process a little bit easier, right? It just keeps it from getting like too overwhelming. So now I'm going to continue cleaning up here. I'm going to distribute that negative through and the x through. and then distribute the negative through and the x through. And then I'm gonna foil this out, but not really, right? If I look at this, I notice that this is like a difference of two squares, right? I have an A plus B and an A minus B. So to foil that out, I really can just do this. That makes life a lot easier. Remember that A plus B times A minus B is A squared minus B squared, right? It's like A and B, A and B. You guys see it? Now, do you have to do that? Could you just foil it normally? Sure, but like, give me that shortcut, man. That like saves me a bunch of weird eyes and stuff and square roots rattling around in there. I don't want to deal with all that. Okay. Um, so I noticed that... I have a plus i root 2 and a minus i root 2. Those give me 0. So I have x squared. I have minus x and minus x. That's minus 2x. I have 1 squared. And what do I get when I have i square root 2 squared like that? I get i squared root 2 squared. Joey's correctly identified that i squared is negative 1, and the square root of 2 squared is 2. So this just becomes, if I take this stuff all together, I get positive 2, right? Because there's a neg two negatives there. I just have a, like an extra goof right there. Yes? Yes. So I'd have that, right? And now I'm going to do one more foil. And let's see, I have minus 2 plus 2, so that's no x cubes. And I have 3x squared minus 1x squared minus 4x squared. And then I have 12x and then minus 9. Here's the good news for you. On a test setting, That would be enough for me. I wouldn't ask you to foil it out. Why not? It's just really time consuming, right? Like, doesn't demonstrate that you know anything more. Like all the stuff that we needed, that we used, that I've just talked about, was just writing that part. 
after that it was just like doing like algebra one and algebra two like grindy algebra no thank you right it's, there's i have enough other interesting things to ask you to do that i don't need to spend 15 minutes trying to foil something out right this is dumb well it's not dumb but it's like you know it's sacrificing doing something interesting or more interesting anyways all right so let's take a look at a couple of examples and then this will be the last two things that I do is this last two examples and we'll be done so again it wants all the zeros, not just the real zeros, but all of them, complex, imaginary, the whole shebang. So the fundamental theorem of algebra tells me I have three zeros. My possible uh, rational zeros say that I should have plus or minus, well, just the factors of 36 divided by the factors of 1, so just the factors of 36. I'll go to my calculator when I type this guy into my calculator. And look at the graph. I'm going to be looking at it from between negative 36 and positive 36. So I do that. I see just one zero here out. It's got to be negative two or negative three, right? So I'll just graph this between, say, like negative six and zero. And it should be a bit pretty obvious what I'm seeing there. So negative four. Oops, I forgot negative four on my list. Ay, ay, ay. And that looks to be a straight. Everybody's okay there? How many zeros am I supposed to have? Three. How many can I see when I looked at the graph? One, and it's of straight. So where are the other two zeros at? The other two have to be then imaginary right they have to be floating around somewhere as complex zeros okay well that's fine so let's get going here zero zero nine negative thirty six zero great So I can say that if I then set this equal to zero, I have negative four. That's great. I saw that on the graph. And then how am I going to solve x squared plus nine equals zero? It's quadratic, so I know I can do it, right? I could use the quadratic formula, but there's an easier way to do this one. What would I do? If it was x squared minus 9, I could do that. And it says it would have to be 3 and negative 3. Um, I'm just going to subtract 9 from both sides and square root. Yes, come on in. I, I don't know. She didn't know. I mean, she might have, but it would have been late last night. I haven't looked at an email yet today. Okay. So, plus I told her that she can do it during community time or her study hall, which she's in here with me anyways, and it's like a 15-minute thing, so I don't know why oh. she wants to do it with you. She said community time, but then 
And she has you for children's. No, she has me for study hall, but that's like Same later thing. today. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Like, I have kids in that. Yeah. Very sexy, bouncy age. Yeah. So. I don't know what she's trying to do. I'm a head. Yeah. I'm okay. Um, squirting a negative, what happens? Yeah, we get an I, right? And the square root of nine is just three. Square root of negative one is I. So I have my one real, and then for the plus or minus, I have two imaginary. That was the starting problem. That's all. I'm just restating what I had and showed the factored form for it. I like to do that after each synthetic division so I don't get confused as to like where I'm at, right? Um, let's look at an example where I might have to do more than one division. That's a good idea, right? This is my last example, so make the most of it. It says find all the zeros to the polynomial function, yada, yada, yada. Remember, all the zeros means imaginary and real. So again, how many zeros should we have? Four. Um, my rational root or uh, possible rational zeros are going to be a whole bunch of them. So I have plus or minus um, one over eight plus or minus one over four plus or minus one over two plus or minus one. And I have plus or minus uh, 5 over 8 plus or minus 5 over 4 plus or minus 5 over 2 plus or minus 5 over 1 and then plus or minus 7 over I, I already regret doing it this way I just too many okay so I have plus or minus 1 5 7 35 over plus or minus 1, 2, 4, and 8. That's much better. Yeesh. Calculator time. Let's take a look and see what we can see. So 8x to the fourth minus 26x cubed plus 27x squared plus 62x minus 35. There's that. I'm going to, I know the smallest zero I can have is negative 35 and the biggest is positive 35. Let's take a look at what we can see. Okay, it looks like I had two straights that are pretty darn close to zero. So maybe just make that negative 2 to positive 2. I think they're straights anyways. Well, they can't be anything else. They have to be. Okay. So this one looks like maybe 1 half. And this one may be uh, Um, oh, probably that's like uh, five fourths, right? Like a little less than negative one. So it looks like I have one half. That was a straight and negative five fourths. 
also straight. So that's two zeros. We're supposed to have four. Where are the other two? Yeah, they're probably imaginary. Okay, so I'm going to start my synthetic division. Um, this one I was a lot seemed a lot more obvious what that was going to be. So I'll start there. Okay, that's great. So what I have there is x minus 1 half times 8x cubed minus 22x squared plus 16x plus 70. But I'm going to just keep going because that is cubic. I don't have any good factoring tool to use on that. I don't have like a cubic formula. So I'm going to do another synthetic division. So I'm going to write negative 5 fourths as a decimal. So now I have negative 1 half, still from before, and then x plus 1.25, and then 8x squared minus 32x plus 56. And we'll set that all equal to zero. Um, before I start applying the quadratic formula, what do you notice about the coefficients in this? Common factor of eight, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull that eight out. I'm going to put four of it in there and two of it into that one. You don't really need to do it that way, but it gets rid of the decimals if I do that. If you just pull it all the way to the front, that's okay, too. Yes. Because after 1, the piece that I'd left was cubic. I don't have any good way to solve that. So I need to keep going until I have linear or quadratic factors. I just need to do another synthetic division. then there should have been something else that was close to the same value on my list. I just picked the wrong, I estimated the wrong one. Like maybe there was like negative four thirds was, should have been, was on my list and that one could have worked. It would have been, there's, then there's something else close. It'll work. I don't give you ones that you can't do this to. Now, does it have to? No. In fact, there is no like 100% stone cold works every time way to solve polynomials. This is actually a very open problem in advanced mathematics and people spend a lot of time like talking about how do we solve and factor big polynomials. Um, so that's like a real question in mathematics. We're still kind of developing new tools to do. Uh, 16 minus 28 is negative 12. So to simplify the square root of negative 12, I know I've got an i, and I also can break 12 into square root 3 times square root 4. Square root 4 is just 2. So I'm going to have 2i, still have that square root 3 then left over over 2. And I can re oops. I can reduce a 2 from both parts. So there's my two imaginary parts. And you're done. At this point, you guys can now finish the problem set. So anything I haven't assigned yet, we could assign. Let's see, what would that be? Numbers 13 through 14. We didn't assign those ones yet. And then 20 to 20, 
well, 20 to the end, right? To 53. Um, as a heads up, we know that Thursday and Friday is virtual. Your assignment for Thursday and Friday is work on this. As a bunch of numbers, these are not short problems in some cases. Take the time that you'd spend, would have spent in class on Thursday and work on this. Okay? Is everybody okay with that? Feel fair? You just did a delta math for me. I see no sense in asking you to do more of those. Yeah. Um, so the homework that we had done up to 19 or whatever, and then the delta math is what we'd be looking for on Sunday. This would be due the week after. Yep. Everybody feel okay? What do you expect next time we see each other in class? Homework quiz. Homework quiz. At least I'm telling you. I could just let you walk in and hand it to you and watch Sydney cry. I'd like to point out, though, that Sydney, you're not complaining, has died today pretty hard. You're not complaining, has died a pretty hard death. <laughs>